Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Artem. I'm from Global Logic Ukraine. We are working on uh, embedded software, uh, Linux kernel, all kinds of wireless networking, and so on. Uh, our company is mostly a technology services company from Silicon Valley in a few locations. Uh, and I will talk about the use case we had uh, with what we create, what we call Nautilus. It's an uh, uh, automotive grade Android uh, with Xen as a basis for it. Uh, basically, we were trying, you know, we were trying to resolve few major goals. Well, that 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 that, that are causing problems right now in automotive world. We were aim is to create the automotive grade Android distribution. It's not like a distribution, you know, the, like Fedora or whatever, but something that vendors can use to accelerate development of Android uh, apps for the, for, for the automotive market. And uh, the, our desire is to create a single platform that would leverage all the AGA, Geneva, Linux, Zen, and other open source stuff to simplify and reduce time to market for end-to-end -end IVI products. IVI is in vehicle entertainment, if, if you wish. So, yeah, and we decided that Zen is going to be a key component of this solution. So why virtualize in automotive? If you need an answer for this question, currently there's a lot of changes coming to the automotive market. First of all, you know, everyone wants to shorten the time to market cycle for the software in, in the automotive industry. Uh, recent few years, there's a new connected car concept when all the car services are connected to the cloud and you have a way to monitor what's going on with your car and probably even your car service are able to see what's going on with your engine, whatever. And uh, you also want to deliver third party applications to your car, like Facebook or whatever. <laughs> And you do the cost reduction for the for the uh, in-vehicle entertainment system development. Uh, I've been a few weeks ago on the Geneva conference, and uh, John Ellis from Ford said that currently the Ford Sync software is already over 10 million lines of code. Probably some of you use Ford, Ford uh, with Sync installed. If someone uses, please raise a hand. No, no one. Oh no, there's one person. <laughs> Okay, and uh, with time we will see that there will be some kind of custom applications being to, to be added for the cars, like navigation, radio, streaming, the connectivity. You know, everyone wants to read emails while driving, maybe with text-to-speech or whatever. Don't text while driving, but anyway, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't telling you that. Everyone wants to post Facebook posts while driving, do Twitters, watch your own favorite videos, Play Angry Birds. Everyone wants to play Angry Birds, right? <laughs> and of course, post the photos of the just drive the car. All right. So when we have all this kind of stuff installed on your phone, and you're installing more and more and more each day, and sometimes your phone freezes because of that, because some software is not very reliable, the operating system is not very reliable. So what happens when when you have that? You just reboot your phone. You don't care, right? What happens if you have all that crap installed in your car? <laughs> it's nothing funny. So we decided to think of what's critical and what's not critical, right? So, yeah, vehicle software. We called it critical stuff, right? Uh, usually, vehicle software is powered by the QNX or some Autosar OS, or maybe automotive Linux. No, 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 not now. And it is responsible for mission critical stuff like. CAN or most or some lean bus or climate control, vehicle services, diagnostic, brakes, whatever you can think, maybe driver assistance in the future, right? And also there's an infotainment software, which is not very hmm, mission critical to say. It can be powered by Windows like Ford Sync or Android in the future, probably. Uh, it, it handles the user interface, text-to-speech, speech recognition, whatever else phone connection, wireless hotspot, navigation, cloud applications, multimedia, everything which is not, as I said, mission critical in your car. If it breaks, you will not hit the tree, right? So, yeah, that's kind of why we want to, why we decided to go with virtualization. Now, a few words about virtualization. Now, we had a very nice presentation by 
uh, Samsung, and I think there's no no doubt that it's possible and it's doable. That's the slide from the ARM presentation. I just copied it to remind you what we have in the architecture. I use it because you know in future I will in, in the future slides I will uh, refer to that. So we have we have the uh, we have the hypervisor uh, level, the privileged, the between the trust zone and uh, sub supervisor mode, and there is a secure state which is not supported, by the way, by the hypervisor. So you cannot do the hypervisor secure stuff. You just need to do calls. If you remember, uh, just remember about this Sasha. If you, you know, in future I will reference it. So Wexen, actually. There is a lot of hypervisor out there. We were thinking about the KVM, about the Green Hills, integrity, so on. So Xen is type one hypervisor. We decided it's very important to keep the hardware, you know, the hypervisor level as thin as possible. And Xen is a way to do this. Uh, it has flexible virtualization modes. We use only HVM, but you know, there is a PVHVM and so on, which is very useful for us. Uh, it allows driver disaggregation. It has ARM support, which is nice, and it's open source. So it means that we were able to start working with it from the zero without waiting all these legal stuff pass through years and years and years. So why we decided to go with OMAP5? We decided to go with OMAP5. Uh, well, it's dual core XA15 SOC, like Exynos. Uh, it has very good interfaces and peripherals, uh, mobile world capabilities. Yeah, there's a ready to use solution from mobile for automotive, like J6 is actually automotive CPU and LM5 was a mobile CPU. And Logic is a TI Platinum partner, so we have access to all the sources, which is also nice. So what we did, uh, key principles. Uh, we decided to go with dual domain, like Android is a DOM U and Linux is a DOM zero. We go with HVM, with SSMU, and enable driver domain, but it's not a separated driver domain. We just map hardware to the Android, to the DOMU, and we firewalled most of the SOC controls, like MMUs, power management. You don't want your Android to, you know, for every reason, disable your head unit while you're driving, right? Okay, so that's the architecture we, we went with. So. It's a software architecture. <laughs> uh, all kinds of vehicle service, service diagnostic system services, and some IPC is in Linux, and everything else, everything you can do for a user is on DOM U. Uh, that's a J6 CPU architecture. You have a lot of, you just as I said, you have a lot of peripherals. That's, that's a public, you can check it out on the ETI website. Uh, we decided that M4 cores, not, not A15, will run software accelerators like boot animation, camera, AV codecs, etc. Uh, most interfaces like UART, I2C, has to be DM8 through SMMU. It's very important. You don't, we, we decided we don't want to do the uh, per virtualized drivers. We want to map the hardware to the DOMU. And to keep it safe, you need to have the system MMU implemented. Unfortunately, it's not there with Xen, but it will be there for hopefully in 4.4. So we did our own hacks for that. Uh, PCI Express is also accessible through SMMU. We don't use it, but anyway. Um, some interfaces like USB and SATA, which have, and this is true for other system on chips. If the interface has its own DMA, not going through the system MMU, you don't have any other option except power virtualization here, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. Fortunately, because probably there's too, too many of them. Uh, MPU, graphics, bit blitter, IPUs, DSPs, all this stuff, which are actually a separate CPUs, right? They have their own MMUs, which can be configured in a way that SMMU is configured, so they can work with the driver domain safely, and even can do sharing between DOM0 and DOMU without power virtualized driver through that MMUs. Uh, that's, you know, a very, very high level and unprecise way how the communication built. 
So DOMU, which runs the HMI and Android frameworks, can communicate directly to the hardware, which is configured by the hypervisor with MMU controls. So DOMU itself cannot control the MMU. It, it will fail if it, if it tries to do so. I mean, system MMU. Um, we decided that the hypervisor is the right place to do the SMMU control. Um, DOM0 has its own, well, it has all the Zen tools, the Vico software, and we moved the PM logic, the power management logic to DOM0. We decided that Android is not allowed to suspend the whole device. And uh, yeah, DOM0 also can, of course, can talk to the, to the hardware, and all the, well, accesses to the hardware, which is a mission critical like CAN, is going through the trust zone. So there's a SMP soft, SMC, SMC software that calls uh, the checks and firewalls these calls. Communication between the DOM U and DOM Zero is done through Xen, and we are building the <coughs> encrypted protocol, again, using the trust zone services because you don't want any kind of message to be passed to DOM Zero. You want to protect them, your DOM Zero here as, as much as possible, since all the Xen tools are there. Okay, so the highlights. Uh, we did, we started with 4.3. We, we took Omega 5 with uh, Linux kernel 3.8, stable kernel 3.8 uh, as DOM Zero, and we had to stick with uh, 3.4 in DOM U. Uh, we backported a few stuff like ATAGs, uh, and backported some Xen support patches to the 3.4. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, a lot of development was done after 3.4, especially on 3.8, 7.8 uh, and, and later. Kernels. Uh, we have decided that we don't want to do, go with virtualization. We wanted to make peripherals to be directly access, accessed by DOMU through memory mapping which is completely insecure, but we, as I said, we are adding the MMU support, so we are kind of covering that stuff. But, and I need to mention here, actually it's not, it's, when I'm saying insecure, I mean that you can, from DOM U, you can program your peripherals DMA to ruin your DOM zero memory. That, that's, that's why it's insecure, first of all. That's the major reason. But if you're protecting it, it's okay. We disabled, Power management, that's what I was asking. <laughs> that's why I was asking about what's your approach. I had hope. <laughs> uh, SMP, well, that's a typo. SMP works for DOM0, and we have no kernel changes on Android side. We wanted to keep the Android kernel as is. Yeah, and we have integrated all this stuff. We managed to integrate, fortunately, all this stuff together. Uh, next steps, something which is not, I call it next steps, but better to say it's not implemented yet. Uh, we want to switch, after this event, we want to switch to 4.4 with SWIOTLB, with SMMUs. We will upstream our changes that we did for SMMUs. Well, hopefully they will be accepted. Uh, as soon as Jacinta 6, which is a full automotive, a kind of automotive version of Oma 5 by TI, as soon as available, we're going to switch it. And we want to go to 3.11 on DOM0 and 3.8 on uh, DOMU, which will allow us to enable SMP in DOMU. That's important, I believe. Uh, we virtualize some of runtime power management. We were thinking of moving some stuff to the hypervisor, but you don't want to move a lot of stuff to the hypervisor, right? So that's very questionable right now. We are going to drop the virtual memory from DOM, for DOMU. Uh, so Everything that is not we, we cannot protect with system MMU, we're going to virtualize. Well, USB and block devices, they, you already have the drivers there. You just need to integrate that. And uh, continue with MMUs and SMC, because we believe that it, it might happen that uh, we will need to have some minimal support of SMC configuration in Xen in, with Trustor. Okay, open issues. So how to make power management, thermal management? I believe there's a lot of talks on LinuxCon about the power always, every meeting probably since five years already or 10 years. So it's a big issue in kernel and same with all the embedded applications. 
We want to review the hypervisor and tools code. We want to address the boot time. Uh, that's one of our major goals in automotive. Uh, we want to switch to the hard time scheduler. I had it probably a CDF as I was advised yesterday. Uh, we want to, well, we need to continue testing performance impact on J6. You know, everyone want to get from SOC as much as possible. And upstream, of course. And the big pain is certification. Uh, all the automotive guys has a very complicated and tough process of certification. If Zen, as a hypervisor, has to run on the hardware, it has to be certified for automotive applications. We don't know how to address that yet. But that's a big, big deal. If we, if, you know, we do it, then great. Someone told me yesterday that Zen used on some military applications. So it's doable, at least. All right, so a few words about our case study. What we, what we treat as a product, or no, not a product, but a solution here, right? So we want to, first of all, the boot timeline. It's very important for us. Uh, uh, we want to have user interface up and running in less than seven seconds. And stuff like rear view camera, right? If you just get into your car, and turn, turn on the ignition, switch on the rear uh, gear, you want to have the camera up and running immediately, and not after seven or 10 or whatever seconds, right? And of course, you want to have the UI up and running in as quickly as possible, and not like your smartphone when it boots up. Uh, half minute, minute, or even worse, right? And you want to have like boot animation nice and sweet. You want to have the uh, your all the controls available immediately, dashboard up and running, so you need to have lots of stuff available as quickly as possible. So that's our timeline that we're gaining right now. Uh, I will not talk about that a lot. There will be a separate presentation by Alex uh, on the AGL track. If someone wants to join, we are welcomed. Uh, but basically, we have few, only a few use cases, like security, as I said, the MMUs and so on. And Zen, of course, as a way to secure the system. Rear view camera, boot time, that's it. Be concentrated on these three major things as a, on this proof concept. So that's what we have so far. Uh, so that's OMOP5 Panda. Uh, is to the zero, we connected the SATA disk and full HD monitor. That's the reset. Uh, after the reset, we have seven seconds right now to boot to UI. So that's U boot, Zen, DOM0, Android. Oh, yes, before the U boot, there's uh, M4 software. You have the Android UI up and running in seven seconds. When you're saying that it's available, it's hardware accelerated, video playback. Someone was asking about video playback. <laughs> uh, that's our favorite test movie. I believe that should be a StarCraft demo. No, no, something different. Okay, so uh, we have video playback, full accelerated UI, whatever else you like. Uh, yeah, there's uh, some, uh, it's not very good video. So it's four point, so Jelly Bean, uh, 4.2, we will migrate to 4.3. Android running in VM, in Dombu. Uh, that's the uh, shell to Linux, we are listing the, you see there's only domain zero and Android to virtual machines up and running. Uh, that's basically it. I need to have a snapshot, snapshot of the details probably. <laughs> yeah, another case we were addressing as we, we are destroying the DOM view. Uh, probably it, it would be better to crash the kernel and restarting it safely. So right now after the start it starts even faster because you don't need to start all the Linux and uh, Zen and uh, other things. I think after that it starts in, in around five seconds. Let's see. Yep, it's around five seconds to start the Android itself. Uh, that's it uh, for the for the for so far for, for today, we are working to improve other cases. Uh, our roadmap is to show the uh, full demo 
with every feature implemented on J6 on CES uh, this January. We will be at TI booth. I mean, TI will have their own booth and we will be present, presenting there. We are, up, we are going to upstream all the Xen changes after migrating to 4.4 to, to avoid any conflicts until end of 2013. And we, you know, we call this stuff Nautilus. We want to invite everyone to contribute it as a platform next year. So, bottom line of my presentation is fairly simple. Xen and ARM on automotive is absolutely use, useful. You can, you can do whatever you want, pro provide all kinds of security. You know what's the car, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, that's, I think that's, uh, that will give Xen a good way into, into car applications. So thank you. See you in Vegas. <laughs>yeah, that right. was that was one of our things. Is to it's here. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, actually, Android has its own CPU frequency manager uh, called Interactive. That means, uh, for of example, course. yeah, when when the user touch uh, launch an application, it will boost the CPU frequency to get the uh, a quicker mm -hmm. response. Yes. So if you um, uh, let, if you uh, just let, uh, let hypervisor to manage the frequency, that means uh, you have disabled the uh, interactive uh, government from the uh, Android. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that means uh, you could uh, get you, you could get, get a, uh, a longer response time when the user launch that application. Yes, definitely, and this is a big deal to understand what would be the right way to you know to manage all the voltages and CPUs for the power management. Yeah. Probably it's not that important for automotive where you have a more limited set of use cases. You don't care about, you know, maintaining your battery life. You know, you have the your car turned on or you have a battery like in Tesla. Huh? You okay. can power up the, your so, smartphone device for probably a few years. Mm -hmm. So uh, in automotive, that's not a big deal. But we, we definitely work on this. And that's why this is kind of question mark. We want to ensure that all kind of delays are minimized, that's first. And second, there is some simplistic way for Android, if not to control the power, but at least to declare its own, you know, define what, what are the requirements at this moment. Like, I do I need to, you know, enable graphics at the maximum frequency or do I need to enable the uh, core CPU at the highest frequency or it's okay, you know, if I have some, uh, uh, wake locks enable it, which domain can, can, domain can I shut down or what, you know, that's, that's why I put the power management to the open issues because it's very, very sophisticated topic. Yeah. And when you have start to talk about multiple Androids, uh, it's becoming even more complicated. If you go with mobile, if, again, on automotive, you don't really care, right? Yeah, because it, you can, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the car um, devices, you can, um, change, you, you can erase the frequency to the maximum. Yep. Yeah, you, you can but, do that. But in car, you still care about the thermal, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, because you, if the uh, uh, application is not busy, you can knock down the CPU frequency because yeah. that can keep the CPU corner. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. As I said, we want to make it more generic. We want to make sure that it's applicable on, on different use cases. Yeah. And even though you can think of use case when you when you're shutting down your car, it might be that the head unit is not going to be, you know, turned off completely. It's going to some suspend mode. Yeah. And in suspend mode, some time to time it needs to check probably its wireless interfaces. Like some, someone from Intel was talking about NFC use case in car. Like you want to wake up your car just getting NFC card yeah. to the, you know, lock, car door lock. Yeah. So in this case, you need to monitor that. So in this case, you need to implement all this kind of stuff. 
If it's Android or if it's the vehicle part, you don't know, but you definitely need to have the power management in this case. So that's why, you know, that's a big open question, how to address that. And I don't think that there is a good solution exists out there for the embedded and virtualization. Yeah, you're right. That is a your challenge. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank yes. You. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, have you done any metrics on power and thermal consumption with and without Zen and just to see what they're like? Because uh, there are rumours that A15s can run hot. Yes, that's true. A15s can run very hot. Uh, we, uh, we were, you see it's Panda, no cooler or big fan. <laughs> So we decided, since we are disabling DPM and we, wanna, we don't want Android to, to manage DPM, we have fixed the frequency at one gigahertz out of 1.5 available. You know, when you are, the more you increase, the more power consumption. So at one gigahertz, we don't have any issues with the, you know, overheating and so on, at least on Panda 5, right? Uh, I think uh, it, it will be the same for Exynos. It's the same technology process. It shouldn't be a uh, big problem. So, and when we resolve the power management issues, we can, you know, increase the frequency to 1.5, 1.7 giga, which will decrease our boot time, and it's very important for us, right? We, we want to take it as quick as possible. But we are not there with a, you know, with a strategy how to manage the frequency and power and voltages. So for now, it's fixed on one giga. We don't have any issues, any thermal issues. So do you write the SMMU driver from scratch or did you pull the Linux driver to Xen? We were using some of the patches published on the tree and doing as much modifications as we could to make sure it's running. Yeah. But that, you know, we, we are trying to reuse whatever is possible and we don't, as I said yesterday, we don't want to deviate far from what's being developed now by the community. And we want to be part of the community. We would love to see whatever you've done with the SMMU. Definitely. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have an idea exactly um, what kind of uh, parameters you need from the, the scheduler as far as um, latency, as far as percentage of CPU and, and, and things like that for your I, I have a list. Stuff? I have a list of requirements from, the, uh, uh, from some of the OEMs, the automotive OEMs. To be honest, I haven't gone through them yet. I, I, need, to, I need to look at them. And that's why I was asking you about the the hard real time stuff yesterday because yeah, sure. I need to I need to understand what are the possibilities and whether we need to you know do a lot of changes or it's not it's not yet analyzed by us. We know that it's, it's a requirement. The hard real time is a requirement, but you know in terms of budgeting, in terms of you know whatever you, th you can think in hard real time, we don't know the complete list. Okay, thank you. Last question, if there is still one. No? Thank you then. Thank you.